One perhaps uh, unexpected beneficiary of the global COVID-19 pandemic has been uh, the carriage of freight by rail, specifically the transcontinental Eurasian carriage of freight by rail. Now, why do I say unexpected uh, as a beneficiary? Because um, unless you happen to work in global logistics, uh, the, the crisis, the various lockdown measures and, and so on may, in your mind, be synonymous with reduced economic output, i.e. less stuff is being made, less stuff is being bought by people therefore and as a result stuff is uh, less stuff needs to be transported whether by air sea road or anything else now that obviously is broadly true um however it does rather depend on what you mean by stuff if you consider stuff to be industrial machinery or car parts both of which are highly lucrative businesses for or lines of business for uh, for rail freight operators then you'd be correct volumes indeed are down because of people are buying fewer machines and fewer cars uh, however on a few specific routes and more specifically still china to the eu and back via kazakhstan and russia um, consignments of certain products um, have been growing exponentially since the start of the crisis. Such products include food, medicines, and indeed medical equipment, ventilators that Europe didn't have, and now uh, inevitably the, uh, the all ubiquitous uh, face masks, which we are uh, sadly uh, familiar with as, as, a, as a fact of life now. Why might this be? Well, Part of the reason is that there, have, there was this spike in demand, all these ventilators, all these masks, et cetera, et cetera, for which demand was, was growing in Europe. And in particular, this demand was not being met by other modes of transport. Uh, shipping takes too long. If you want to send a, a container ship from the east coast of China, the ports on the east coast, through to Rotterdam or some other, uh, some other port in Europe, it takes probably 30 days on average going via the Strait of Malacca and the Suez Canal, the standard route. Um, whereas a train takes 15 or 18 days. So there's a, a 15 to 18 days, depending on the precise route it runs, but it's, uh, it's an obvious time saving of a best, the best part of two weeks. Um, in terms of time savings, obviously the quickest mode of transport is air freight, but that was impossible because most of the flights were grounded. Um, anecdotally speaking, I, I sent a birthday card from uh, Paris to Hong Kong um, in March, and what would normally take 10 days, um, a, a birthday card, not a package, just a thing, a, a card weighing no more than 20 grams, in fact less than 20 grams, it took, a ho it took over a month. Um, and again, anecdotally, a, a friend of mine's um, a friend of mine's wife is a bone marrow specialist. She's a doctor, and she regularly has to import bits of bone marrow, specimens of bone marrow, um, for purposes of her work from other European countries. What was a standard procedure before the lockdown became very complicated, um, and featured at one point, I think, a specimen of bone marrow going from London Heathrow to Schiphol, from Schiphol to Geneva, and from Geneva up to Paris, the world's best traveled bit of bone marrow. Um, but anyway, uh, suffice to say, in this context, rail was able to step up and meet a gap in the market. Uh, and not before time, I should say, because if you look at the actual uh, the modal share of each mode of transport on uh, transcontinental routes between Asia and Europe, rail represents 1% a measly paltry 1% of overall uh, transport volumes, whereas shipping is 95% and air is the other 4%. Um, so the rail railways, there was plenty of room for and potential for the railways to grow their market share and, and they were able to, thanks in part to some pioneering work done by rail freight operators in Europe and over the last few years, Deutsche Bahn, for example, in Germany, um, which uh, uh, which has been running trains from China through Russia and Kazakhstan um, to their freight to a freight terminal in Duisburg, Western Germany. Um, also, thanks, it has to be said, to the Chinese government, whose uh, official policy, one belt, one road, or new Silk Roads, or whatever you want to call them, um, has is all about li better linking um, different parts of the world, in particular um, uh, in terms of trans transport links. So, can we say? that the crisis has been an unmitigated success for the rail freight operators? Uh, yes and no, not quite. Um, as, often, um, as often happens when demand outstrips supply, capacity bottlenecks rapidly emerged. 
um, specifically at border crossings um, from one country into another, obviously, from China into Kazakhstan in particular, a border crossing um, at a place called uh, Alashanku Korgos. I presume that Korgos is on the Kazakh side and Alashanku on the Chinese side. I'm not 100% certain. In any case, um, the the spike in demand um, led to massive delays. By the end of June, um, trains were running up to two weeks behind schedule because it took them so long to get through this border point, this, this pinch point, um, where all the bureaucracy, the paperwork, all the customs formalities, everything else has to be accomplished. Um, that's the first problem. Uh, another problem is one that just affects freight transport in general. Basically, um, the sites of production and the sites of consumption are not the same and they are reflective of broader trade imbalances in the world. I mean, in layman's terms, some countries are net exporters of goods and other uh, countries are net importers. You have surpluses on the one hand, deficits on the other. Um, that is true whether it's rail freight, air freight or indeed um, anything else. And it is this contributes obviously to saturation at the bottlenecks like uh, uh, Alashanku Korgos, because there are many, many more trains heading westbound um, than there were going the other way. So that created a kind of this bottleneck. Um, another problem is that it's not actually economical. It makes no business sense to send a container one direction only full. The idea is to go full in one direction, be emptied, be filled up with something else and then move on. But if Europe doesn't have anything to sell back to China, it becomes, uh, the business case becomes less obvious. Um, and in particular in the current context, they're not, as I said, automobile parts, industrial machinery, typically high value goods that are sold from Europe uh, into China. Um, there's, not, there's not enough going back the other way necessarily to make these trains uh, economically viable. The, the third problem um, is, a, is a more physical problem and it concern, concerns the fact that ISO containers, the standard shipping containers in which everything is now uh, transported, um, obviously weigh an awful lot more when they're, when they're full than when they're empty. And there have been cases um, in a number of European countries of empty ISO containers blowing off the back of trains uh, because it's windy. Okay obviously they should secure them properly etc but even uh, bearing that in mind um, there is this still this safety hazard of potentially um, uh, empty containers not just being not uh, economically unviable but actually dangerous uh, to, to carry around particularly over long distances. Now I think it, everyone would probably agree that it is in the it's in everyone's benefit for uh, for there to be smoother um, flows of rail freight between Europe and Asia. After all, we are meant to be all, uh, go general government policy is meant to be about uh, facilitating transport by rail because railways are green, they're good for the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But one fundamental obstacle to this is a, a lack of harmonization. In other words, fragmentation. Uh, this is something you encounter all the time in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the rail sector. Um, and it's much less frequent in other, um, in, in other modes of transport. Railways essentially grew up, historically speaking, as national concerns. There were, many of them were confined to their own borders. There was relatively little cross-border traffic to begin with. And as such, they tend to be characterized by complexity and uh, a preponderance of national rules, all of which con uh, constitute barriers to interoperability. Some of those are technical the distance between the rails, most obviously, um, the size of the tunnel, that kind of thing. But some of them are also legal. And if you look at the various different international conventions governing, governing international uh, transport by various modes, um, what you notice is that for the other modes of transport, there's only one. For uh, air, for example, there's the Montreal Convention, which is the successor to the Warsaw Convention. It's probably more famous older sibling. Um, for the road uh, sector, there's something called the CMR. Um, a, it is an international agreement governing um, the carriage of freight by, uh, by road. Um, it is recognized across Europe in 45 countries. It's recognized as a customs document um, the, uh, and uh, it's what allows, legally speaking, you to get in a lorry in Portugal and drive it to the Russian border. Um, that's not uh, as easy, either technically or legally speaking, with trains. 
Um, also for shipping maritime, uh, there is the Hamburg rules and these are also have the advantage of being a single document setting out comprehensive uniform uh, liability conditions. For example, liability is a big, a big, big problem or a big, big issue um, when trying to manage uh, international freight flows because what if the goods get lost? What if the goods get damaged? All this has to be, there has to be answers to these questions. Um, whereas if we look at the railways, what do we see? Well, there's more than one regime. In Western Europe, there's something called the COTIF um, and in an appendix to the COTIF governing the international carriage of freight called CIM or SIM. Now you can tell how long these things were signed because the acronyms are all French. Um, if they were signed, if they'd been invented in the last 10, 15 years, they would be English, but they're not. Um, uh, the uh, COTIF countries are broadly speaking Western Europe, well, in fact Europe in general because of the also Eastern Europe, um, and to some extent are the sort of Mediterranean Rim countries, some of the North African countries, Turkey, Iran, I think as well. That's on the one hand, and then you have these other countries, the former USSR, Russia, the Central Asian countries, which apply a different set of rules and regulations called the SMGS. I have no idea what it stands for, but it's their convention um, governing international freight. For a long time, to run a train from Europe to China or back again, you uh, these these two regimes, these two legal regimes, were not interoperable. So the train would get to the border at I don't know the Polish uh, Belarusian border, and it would have to be what they call reconsigned. Um, it doesn't mean physically moved or shifted about. It's not a technical procedure, but it was it was uh, it is legally speaking running under a different legal regime, and so its consignment note would was a SIM consignment note up to the border, and then it would have to be another consignment note, a whole set, new set of documents basically, to make out just so it could continue, even though technically there was no barrier to it continuing. This is all rather strange. It creates excess bureaucracy, it creates, it makes, creates more cost, creates more uncertainty, um, and, and that remains to some extent the case. Reconsignment is a thing of the past now because there is now something called the harmonized consignment note for SIM, and SMGS, so West and East, very broadly speaking, Europe and Asia. Um, nonetheless, the fact is there's still two, there are two regimes, not one. And, and only when there is a single overarching liability regime stretching from the Pacific to the Atlantic and back again, will we be able to say that rail is competing um, on, a, on a level footing with, uh, with, with other modes of transport. By way of conclusion, because I have to conclude at some point, despite the fact that I could probably talk about this all day and all evening as well, um, I wanted to share this with you as a piece of good news in some ways, um, to say it hasn't been all bad in the crisis. A, an eco-friendly mode of transport has, has gained. It's received a shot in the arm, um, f admittedly from fairly appalling circumstances, but nonetheless, um, it's, a, it, it's a, perhaps a good and encouraging sign for the future. All we can hope really is that once of some sort of return to business as usual, new normality um, happens, whenever that is, and whatever the new normal actually looks like, um, all we can hope is that the outstanding legal barriers will be overcome, because otherwise um, the solution is either to carry on shipping everything, moving everything by ship, or, and this is a really radical solution, to relocate production to Europe. That, however, is a subject for a very different speech. Thank you. <laughs>